We've got a slight problem with the studio room in that it's so well sealed that when both of these doors are shut, you basically choke to death. So now that the weather has cooled down a bit, it's finally time to tackle the ventilation. Hiya folks and welcome back to the show. As you will know, if you've been following the studio room project, you will know that there's been this one lingering job that needed to be sorted out and that is ventilation. This is a very, very well sealed room. And as a result, you don't actually run out of oxygen. Instead, you get carbon dioxide poisoning. So to get us by in the meantime, I bought this little carbon dioxide sensor thing. And this gives us a vague idea of what's going on. Normally, when the room's not being used, it's sitting around the 400 mark. But as soon as the double doors are shut, it doesn't take long for that to get up to kind of two, three thousand. It's to the point that I've even had to put a little sign on the door just in case, you know, people might be in here, I'm not around, and they need to be aware of when it's getting to dangerous levels. Now, I have been reliably informed that carbon dioxide poisoning feels like you're drowning, so it's unlikely that you're going to have a problem without noticing. But even so, let's play safe on this one. It'll be interesting to see actually, even in the course of making this video, what are we on at the minute? 781. I'll shut both of these doors and we'll see what we get up to in kind of five, 10 minutes time. So I wanted to go for something a little bit better than just simply a fan in the wall, because the problem with that is that in the winter time, there's no kind of central heating in this room as such. So you don't really want just freezing cold air getting drawn into the room. And likewise, in the summertime, you want things to kind of balance out as well. So I have gone for like an MVHR system. It's probably the cheapest MVHR thing that I can find, but it seems to get pretty good reviews. It's a care system that I'm using here. This was about 300 quid or something like that. It's basically this unit, and then it's got this kind of humidity detector thing that you install separately. You run a cable from that to the unit and it's got like a pull cord on, but I think it's um, automatic or at least semi-automatic. I know nothing about MVHR or what would it be? Single room SR, SRHR would it be? Single room heat recovery. Anyway, I know nothing about it. So we're gonna be kind of fumbling through this together, but it doesn't look that complicated. I just need to drill a great big six inch hole through the wall and then wire it all up. Obviously drilling a six inch hole through the wall of a soundproof room is gonna cause problems with sound transmission. But the way I see it with this, this isn't just a hollow tube. This has loads of gubbins inside it to make the heat recovery work. And it's quite clever the way it works as well. There's not a huge amount of space for air to kind of travel through the tube around this. So I think it's not gonna be as big a problem for sound transmission as you would first imagine, but we shall see. If it is a problem, I've got a few ideas up my sleeve, but we'll, we'll try it and we'll see how we get on. Very clever the way this works. This bit goes on the inside and instead of simply drawing air in from outside, what it does is it passes it over all of these fins and things and it recovers the heat and the heat that's leaving the room passes over these fins, warms the fins up and therefore the cold air that gets drawn in gets warmed up by the warm air that's leaving, if that makes sense. So that's kind of the, the general principle of heat recovery systems. And as I say, my understanding is that it kind of works in reverse as well. So in the summertime, if you've got cooler air in here, it's gonna keep the fins of this cool while warm air gets drawn over it and therefore you don't get really, really warm air getting blown into the room. The warm air gets cooled down by the fins. I think that might be total nonsense. Anyway, the first thing we need to do is work out where to drill a massive hole through the wall. Now I don't particularly want to go through this wall because it'll look ugly when I'm filming and this is kind of a bit of a feature wall. So if you imagine the kind of grill of this sat like on the wall somewhere up here, it's not gonna look pretty. And our neighbors are directly on the other side of that. Likewise, I don't wanna go for the opposite wall because that just creates the same problem, but heading through to the neighbors on this side. And plus that'll look quite unsightly from outside because the wall on the other side of this is like right in the middle of our garden. 
in an ideal world would go somewhere in this wall here because any sound that gets out in that direction where there's nothing at the bottom of the garden but I've got my curtains and I don't particularly want to get rid of the curtains because they're really useful for sound absorption and privacy and just light control and stuff like that. The other option is to go somewhere in this wall here. I would probably go in that top corner. It does mean that any sound escaping through it is going to be pointing towards our house. But there's about a, what, 15, 20 meter gap between this building and our house. So that probably would be the easiest way of doing it. And we've got the electric consumer unit down the bottom there as well. So in terms of like routing of stuff, that's probably going to be the easiest. But hmm, I'm in two minds. Let's toss a coin. Heads that corner, tails that corner. I haven't made that up folks, it's heads. Time to break out the really big core drill. Oh and by the way we've only been in here what 10-15 minutes and we're at what 1200 already on the CO2. Right so X marks the spot and what I've also done is the usual thing of printing out what was on this wall before all the plasterboard went on and everything just to double check because we've got some wall straps coming down that we don't want to hit electric cables and things but here should be perfect and the main thing I need to do now is drill a pilot hole all the way to the outside that's on a slightly downwards trajectory to stop any rainwater trying to come into the studio where we're coming through just there if you can see which is pretty much perfect really so uh, okay let's uh, crack on so this is the 117 mil hole saw that I normally use for 110 mil waste pipes and things like that but for this we need the big boy hole saw and this is 152 millimeters this may break my drill So somewhat predictably the clutch on my old Makita SDS is just far too sensitive for a big drill like this. So I ended up switching over to my trusty sight backup drill. No luxury such as a safety clutch so I just need to be really careful because if the drill binds it can break your wrists but this drill isn't particularly powerful so we should be okay but if the drill does get stuck I need to just remember to let go of it as quickly as possible. Basically don't try this at home. So obviously on this side, I've got the cladding to deal with and a whole saw like this, it'll absolutely destroy the cladding. It'll just split it and everything. So my plan is I'm going to draw around this and cut the cladding first. And I'm going to do that with our friend, the multi-cutter. So I really don't want the hole saw to be binding on the cedar, otherwise it's going to rip it to shreds and destroy it. So I'm just going to have to nibble away at the edges here to get it absolutely perfect with um, the router very carefully.
Now, I'm kind of in two minds whether to use silicon here or acoustic sealant because I need to kind of seal this tube into the wall so there's no gaps around it or anything. I think I'm going to uh, go for acoustic sealant to be honest and um, we'll just kind of hope for the best. I'm not going to be shy with it. I'm also just going to fill inside the dot and dab cavity as well. So I know it ain't pretty, but uh, needs must. It's not very easy to kind of get access to get in there. I'll shove the tube in and then I'll seal the outside as well. Now, it does say that you're supposed to glue this on to here, so I'm just going to use a bit of silicon to attach that on. And because it's a tiny bit too short to get through the wall because of the cladding, I'm just going to extend it out by about five millimetres. I think that'll be absolutely fine doing that. Let's pop it on, but I'm not spending. 50 quid on a duct extension kit for five millimeters. Right, I'll leave that to go off. It should be all right. I'll quickly show you the story so far and how everything's going to kind of connect up on the inside and how this is going to work. But basically, humid air from inside the room comes out of here and then fresh air gets sucked in through the bottom here. I've sealed everything around these edges, just obviously with it being on panelling. I don't want any chance of water getting behind this. Combination of all-weather sealant around the edges and acoustic sealant as well. My only slight concern is if you get really, really heavy driving rain, is it going to get into the tube? I mean, the tube does slope outwards, but um, you can see we've got a couple of drops here of just dew and it's not trying to go into the vent, so we'll just kind of keep an eye on that and hope for the best. For all intents and purposes, the outside is done. Then on the inside, our Sparky's been and done all of the first fix electrics. So there'll be a fused spur there. The cable then comes along from that and then up to the control unit, which will be at the top there. And then there's just a low voltage cable going behind the plasterboard over and popping out to the actual fan itself. First batch of fillers in, that's just going off at the minute and then it'll get a second batch and then uh, Mrs. Matt will paint it all and it'll look as good as new. I think the plan is to just take the feed for the fuse spare from that socket down the bottom. Although he could go straight into the consumer unit if he wants, completely up to him, I don't particularly care. And then it's just theoretically a case of plugging the actual heat exchanger in. This is the control unit that goes on the wall as well. I'm generally impressed, very impressed with the build quality of all of this. It's really nicely thought through. So we've got the mains voltage stuff comes in on the right there, goes under the little saddle clamp and straight into that connector block on the right. And then the low voltage stuff comes out on the left here. I'll go into all the controls later on, but yeah, the quality of this amazingly good for the money. And then on the heat exchanger itself, obviously we've got the back panel already fitted in the wall and that literally just plugs into those three little pins there. So it's just a case of like 
it's plug and play really. The silicon's all set on this top piece now, so hopefully it'll fit. Maybe I should do a dry fit. I don't want to permanently fix this in place until all the fillering's done and things, because there's going to be dust going everywhere, so I want to give everything a good clean out. But let's try it, see if it actually fits. Like a glove. I'll never get that back off now. Let's... But yeah, easy as that. So I'm going to plough on with all these other jobs and I'll come back to you once the Sparky's been and done the set and fix so that I can actually show you it working. But there's not much more to it than that. Fingers crossed. We are ready to rock, very exciting. So interestingly, it's gone straight into boost mode, which um, boost isn't on. I'm not sure if that's a humidity thing or, let's see, yeah, it is. So basically the way this works, we've got a humidity little dial on the bottom of here. It's all triggered by humidity. Nothing to do with carbon dioxide or anything like that. So we've got the master switch over here that basically controls this unit and then as I say it's just low voltage from this unit to the actual fan and the way it works the fan is always in just kind of trickle mode so I'm not sure if you can hear it at the minute but it's in trickle mode at the moment. If I hold my mic next to it you might be able to hear it. It's really pretty quiet but it basically gets triggered into boost mode by the humidity level that you have set on the bottom of this now i'll come back to that because that can be a little bit problematic and i'll also do a sound test in a minute as well and i'll show you how much sound's actually getting through to the outside through the fan and potentially how much sound can therefore get into the studio room but basically at the moment i've got this humidity thing set at 80 percent so in other words, the fan's not going to go into boost mode until we get up to above 80% humidity. But you can turn it on to boost mode at any time just by pulling this dangly cord. So that's it now running on full blast. So you know, if you really wanted to boost the ventilation in the room for a period of time, I would say that's more if you're using it in maybe a, a steamy bathroom or something like that. I think for most of the stuff that we're going to be doing in here, just having it in trickle mode is going to be absolutely fine. This has also got a light sensor built into it, but I'm not really making use of that. But the idea of the light sensor is that at night time, you don't want it going into boost mode if you've got it like in a bedroom or something like that, and you don't want it waking people up. So you can set the light sensor so that it only goes into boost mode while it's daylight. But because this room is generally quite dark anyway, it's always going to think it's night time. So I've just got the light sensor switched off. To change that, you just have to take these three screws out and you adjust it from the inside. Now, talking of humidity, at the moment in the room with this just on trickle, I'm not sure if you can see, but it's currently at 71% humidity in here. And that presents a little bit of a problem. Now, I do think part of the issue is that this room has never been ventilated for probably over a year. So the humidity levels are probably quite high in here anyway. There's been signs of mold growth all over the place. 
Mrs. Mack has done a full deep clean top to bottom on the whole place and it is immaculate now but at the end of the day it was a completely sealed room with no ventilation whatsoever it's down kind of the bottom of the garden so we were really pushing it it'd be interesting to know if any of you have got garden rooms do you run into any problems with mold or anything like that because i know a lot of garden rooms are getting put in with pretty much no ventilation so it'd be interesting to know if you run into these sort of issues but the other side of it is that outside at the moment, it's about 70% humid. So all we're doing by having this on is blowing humid air into here from outside and then sucking it back out again. But the humidity is never gonna get below whatever the humidity is outside. So as a result, I'm having to keep this set quite high. I've got it set on about 80% at the minute. If I turn it any lower, so I'll just turn that knob. See there, it's kicking in there. And this is showing about 73%, which is not far off from what the meter was saying. But the point is, I don't want this running 24 seven on boost, especially through the night, because, you know, it's just pointless. There's no one in the room. So I'm having to set the humidity quite high. I need to check the instructions because you might be able to completely disable the humidity sensor. But anyway, that's another topic for another day. In a nutshell though, that's it. There's nothing more complicated than that. It just sits there trickling fresh air into the room over the heat exchanger and it takes humid stale air out of the room through these side vents here. And if the humidity gets too high, it automatically puts itself on boost. And if you want to force it to be on boost, you just pull the little cord. The other thing that you're going to be wanting to know, how much difference has this made to the soundproofing because we have drilled a huge hole through our concrete wall. So as per usual, I'm just going to pop some royalty free music on and we'll turn it up on the mixer to an uncomfortably loud level. That's loud enough, let's head outside. So I'm standing about four meters away from that vent at the minute. Um, you can hear it just, but if you get really close to it, let me just, uh, kind of set the camera up around here somewhere. Can you hear that? So I'll do my usual kind of test of putting the microphone right next to it. And obviously with the mic right next to it, you are gonna hear it, but uh, let me just show you. So that would be the equivalent of me putting my ear next to it so uh, yeah it's not bad but it certainly made a difference but if i just head back into the room i mean that is a pretty serious volume level that's going there so make of that what you will folks i mean for general day-to-day -day use and for me recording in here that is going to be absolutely fine. Obviously, there's no lawnmowers or anything like that running at the moment outside, so it's hard to get a good reflection of how much sound's going to be bleeding into the room. But given how loud that was, I think it's going to be okay. But be under no illusions, this has made a big difference to the soundproofing of the room. And what you absolutely can hear now through the vent very clearly is the noise of the drum kit. The drum kit just gives off so much sound energy, it's just too much for this to cope with. And especially the high frequencies are getting through this absolutely no problem whatsoever. So things like the cymbals and the snare drum and stuff like that, yes, you absolutely can hear that from outside now. It has made a big difference. But we kind of expected that. We've just removed a massive six inch hole all the way through two skins of concrete. So if it didn't make any difference, it would make you question, well, what's the point in having big thick concrete walls in the first place? But this is something I am gonna need to address later down the line, because ultimately I want it so that I can record in here without sound getting in, 
and also obviously when I'm recording the drums I don't want sound to escape from the room as well. So my plan is to build some sort of enclosure around this but it's not going to be as simple as just literally putting a box and ductwork over the top of this because this has to have the ability of blowing air out and sucking air in. What you don't want to do is enclose it in such a way so that all we end up doing is basically funneling the fresh air back out of the outlet vents again. So we'll have to put some thought into how that'll work. I'm probably going to keep that as a members only video over on the members zone, members.coffeewithhandyman.com if you're not already up and running on there because it's going to be a little bit niche for this channel. So if you want to know how all that turns out then head over to the members zone and uh, once that video is done you will see it pop up on there. I'm not in a huge rush to get that done at the moment, I've got plenty of other things to do. We're heading into winter now, it's not like people are going to be sitting out in their gardens and we're going to be disturbing them, but it is definitely on the to-do list. Another thing I could do as well, obviously, is build some sort of cowling on the outside of the building as well, but I'm going to have exactly the same problems because the vent on the wall is an outlet and an inlet, so it's not as simple as just kind of building a box around it. So folks, I hope you enjoyed that and found this vaguely useful, even if you've got no intention of putting ventilation into a studio room. You can use these things in bathrooms and in any part of your house really where you want to bring fresh air in and take stale air out but you want there to be some sort of heat exchange between the outside and the inside. Don't forget to give me a follow on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now, Gosforth Andy on X. Chatting about all sorts of different things over there and it's a good place if you want to get hold of us and chat to us. Then X is probably your best bet. I reply to pretty much everything on there and sometimes the comments on YouTube are kind of drowning all of the comments that come in over the course of 500 or so videos so sometimes it's difficult to kind of keep track. Anyway, be nice to one another, look after each other and we shall see you next time. Tatty bye!